winding down to the term, but then having to use the last few weeks to sort of quite quickly retool and plan how we're going to continue and how we're going to continue to support our students who are now isolated or perhaps in different parts of the world than they expected to be in, in any, in any case, just not part of the student community that they had in the same way and not, not able to access those things. So we've been having lots and lots of Zoom meetings like this, um, both internally uh, with staff but also in tutorials and in, in, in conversation with students in some cases. So my term at the Royal College is still running. So I've been having online tutorials with them and talking about how to do dissertations when you can't get to the library. Tough, tough call. Um, but also talking with my teaching colleagues at Central St. Martins in terms of how we're going to sort of carry on and how we're going to support our students moving forward. And then also talking about how we're going to take the exhibition that had to close abruptly at the ROBA and how, whether we should make a virtual version of that and how we can allow people to enjoy things. So yeah, just retooling generally. And I don't have a home office, so this just all happens in my kitchen or on my sofa. And I'm, I'm dressed up here, not so much down there, so <laughs> yeah. I think that you're uh, in a similar boat to a lot of people where the, the home office has become the kind of bed or the sofa or the living room uh, and Zoom meetings are just constant. <laughs> Tom? I should also say I haven't been, there's definitely been days when I haven't been that productive and I hope that's true of all of us. This is mm -hmm. a very, very odd time and just not being able to concentrate, not being able to focus and frankly just being worried and in touch with lots of, I think that's perfectly normal and all of us have had to just allow that a little bit like it is an odd time and that's okay definitely definitely Tom uh, do you want to tell us about what you've been up to yeah so work we when we left the office I think three weeks ago now as in we so before I think about a week before we were told we had we should we basically decided to shut up the zine because there's a growing sense in the office that people were uncomfortable coming in and then we told everyone that if you're uncomfortable coming in don't basically and then it got to the point where it felt a bit irresponsible to be coming in at all so we decided to basically tell everyone just to work from home um as a digital magazine uh we have everyone kind of has the ability to work from home so we had a work from home policy in place so everyone could leave Basically, everyone was working from home a bit, but um, suddenly everyone's at home. And then it's basically just been a bit of a firefighting. I mean, it, it's, it's while digital technology and working remotely is good, it's, and whatever researching or whatever it is you're doing remotely, it's basically, it's very tough not speaking to people on a daily basis. And all the way communications, um, I'm trying to coordinate however many, how many people we've got, 10-ish people in our editorial team, and just trying to figure out on a daily basis what everyone's doing would take me minutes in the office, is taking me basically hours. So a lot of my time has just been spent doing dull admin and Slack chats and a lot of trying to figure out what everyone's doing whilst, um, yeah, not getting too stressed. And also everyone in the company has been kind of stressed by there's been a lot of change so everyone's just asking and trying to figure that out and it, it's been yeah everyone's been kind of thrown off by it myself included i've also been massively unproductive for the first couple of days at least mostly because i'm yeah like typing conversations rather than speaking is just takes forever um even and then even if you're speaking to people it's it, it's by the time you send them a link it's still yeah it's a, it's not a ideal way of doing anything but I feel like I've been getting better at it um, this week, especially this week. I've started getting up on time and basically getting into a habit of showering and then going into a workspace. Uh, right now it's my baby's bedroom, but like uh, into a workspace that's not and somewhere that's separated, basically. Um, that's about it. And then just writing shitloads of stuff about the coronavirus and <laughs> trying to carry on writing in the normal sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like um it's a kind of 
it's that thing of like you've got to make sure that you get up and move to a different space almost to work um yeah really had that and I was speaking to the photographer Jim Stevenson the other day and we were talking about how like just getting dressed and putting on your clothes makes such a big difference rather than working in your pajamas and things like that um, I've got that far I'm still I'm still wearing joggers and a hoodie wherever like <laughs> I'm the same hoodie I've worn all week and it's covered and in- you always wear joggers and a hoodie I've yeah. seen you I've been, been, been in the office <laughs> um and also there's the personal stress which I'm sure everyone's got um my entire team has partly their work stress. Everyone's a bit worried about their jobs. Mm-hmm. Everyone's also worried that they're being as productive as they should be, which is slightly unreasonable. But everyone's got, everyone wants to be helpful because it's a difficult time. And everyone's slightly worried they're doing what they should be, which they are all are. And then everyone has got their own personal mini crisis or boredom going on. I mean, I'm, there's me, my wife and the baby in a basement flat, a basement of terrace. We've got a garden. But it's pretty pretty intense you know he's only eight weeks old and he doesn't sleep and so it's um i'm not sleeping that much either so it's a tough time and everyone on my staff has got their own weirdness which is exactly the same but different so it's just trying to balance being useful as a boss and a friendly ear as well (laughs) i think that's definitely students are having to kind of negotiate as well that kind of feeling that you've you've got you've got this time at home now so you've got to be productive you've got to be working but actually there should be a moment where you can just like not be so productive and have time and have time to think um definitely yeah I was just gonna say um the best day I had last week was definitely the day when I had student tutorials from a selfish point of view because it allowed me to kind of focus on lots of different things to think about and feel useful but also yeah, to basically reiterate what you just said, Zora, to say, you know, downtime is really useful and really productive. And you should, if you're fortunate enough to be in a situation where your basic needs are met and you're not caring for somebody else all the time, then um, try to not feel that pressure. I think, you know, anyway, all to say that the crit day was the best day. So let's do some some talking about things, talking about work, if anyone wants to pipe up with anything. Yeah, so let's um, let's move on a little to kind of the topic of days and architectural criticism and theory. Um, so I, I guess I did have one question that I wanted to really ask Tom. Actually, was um, I know that like you did your your kind of MA dissertation on data centers, uh, but we've had quite a lot of um, students ask like, how do you choose a topic? So I wondered whether you could tell us a bit about how you chose that topic. Uh, probably not the best example. I did my MA part time, uh, and I took two and a half years to figure out what I wanted to do with my dissertation. So, <laughs> anyone who's wanting to make a quick decision on what to write about, probably don't follow my path. Um, so I did the part time MA. So I did it, taught lessons over two years, and then. Um, the summer that my dissertation year, I got married in America, and kind of that was a kind of an organisational mess. So I delayed it, and then on the part time MA, I don't my one. I don't think you needed to complete it for five years from the start date, or maybe six. But anyway, so I basically just didn't. I waited until I want. I found something I wanted to do. <laughs> so um, yeah, I. I that's not great advice apart from when I did find something I was really interested in it it made it much easier and therefore <laughs> enjoyed it much more because I was doing something I wanted to do um but yeah <laughs> <laughs> great advice as ever <laughs> I mean I have lots to say about this one yes. yeah sorry Shimi I cut you off no, I was just saying I have lots to say about this one from kind of both sides of the fence. I mean, I was I was pretty indecisive as a student, um, not because I didn't know what to do, but because I was in love with so many different subjects. And I remember in my third year uh, going to see my tutor with a list of eight possible things. And he was just bored of indecisive students at this point. My students, if there are any of you out here, you'll be bored of me telling you this story too. But he dropped a pen on my list and said, right, you're doing that one. And I was sort of dismayed. And I was like, oh, well, 
all of a sudden I knew what I wanted to do because it wasn't the one that the pen landed on. Um, so, you know, you could pass a coin, you could chill out about it because it is just one essay and you can write lots, uh, you know, in your lifetime. So <laughs> that's one way of looking at it. But on the other hand, this like definitely true to what Tom was saying just now, pick a subject that you are interested in and that you like. I think you might be tempted to think, well, what's on point right now? You know, what's perhaps I should write about sustainability because that's important just now. Um, and, you know, I can see your logic that you kind of think that that's going to be practically important, but ultimately your your dissertation, your thesis, what have you, is a little piece of you being able to show what you're interested in, what your specific take is. So I'd really advise that you choose something that you have some feeling for, that you've, that you've got some possibility of adding something of your own to. Otherwise, you're just going to be gathering what's out there and sort of reproducing it in an essay package. And that's not, not very original, not very useful. So I would say it doesn't matter what your interests are, but try and find out what they are and take the opportunity to make your dissertation something that you know you care about um and the way you balance that is to see what's out there so i think that's where research comes into it and that's you know a lot of that happens online we should talk about that mm -hmm. particularly if you can't get to your libraries and you can't necessarily get to your tutors but um balancing something that you're passionate about with something that it is feasibly possible to research is i think the the then perfection yeah yeah i teach um dissertation at greenwich and i always say to my students like it's got to be something that you care about and that you want to write about because you're going to be stuck doing it for kind of three or four months um and you and you want to like love what you're researching or you want to kind of care about it um as a topic so it's also one of the it's one of the most it's probably the most time you get to write about one thing in a relatively I know it probably seems quite stressful and it is stressful at the time but it's a real opportunity to really spend some time writing about something that you want to um, and that opportunity doesn't come across that often that you get to write about something that you that you really want to I mean I don't know for me it hasn't anyway like I occasionally get to write stuff about stuff I really want to but a lot of the time I'm writing about stuff that don't know either someone's paying me for or like uh i think needs to be or should be written rather than something i just think yeah this is just what i want to write about right now and the dissertation does give you the opportunity um i think <laughs> i mean just thinking of all the people who who never want to write about anything um just just a quick note to say you can write a dissertation do you know how many people write dissertations every year you can definitely write something and you can definitely find something about what you want to write about so try not to be daunted by it the nice thing about architecture and design subjects i mean i'm assuming most of our audience is largely architectural at, at the moment but even in um slightly broader design subjects um they're quite accommodating you know you can write about most things or, or kind of t tailor most interests that you have towards some kind of architectural question i've seen so many questions that seem like they come from personal interest turn into really passionate architectural dissertations you know whether they're about grime music or computer games or 15th century frescoes or whatever your geeky little passion is um or something that you don't necessarily think is something that falls into let's say the design studio the dissertation is often an opportunity to kind of explore some of that mm. um, whatever you can do to make it something that is some kind of genuine reflection of yourself and therefore hopefully a bit enjoyable I often think sometimes the topics that are like the kind of most niche and most weird and geeky are like my favorite topics. Um, they're always the ones that like you like as a as someone marking them or reading them, you kind of learn a lot more about that kind of about the person and about the subject. Um, but um, talking about you, you kind of picked up a little bit on this to me. It was like about research and how you do that when the libraries and when the schools are closed. How are you how are you advising your students to kind of their research now um it's tough 
All right, I'll be frank. So some of them are freaking out about not having access to the library, but I've been teaching for 10, 11 years this year. That's a really long time. Um, and I've been looking at bibliographies for 11 years and I know my students don't spend that much time in the library necessarily looking at hard copy books, just saying. So, um, I mean, that's not, to that, that's not to dismiss the fact that you miss the library as a place to work and as a place to access information, but I'm just saying there is a lot of content out there and I know you know that. So now the questions are about how to be more precise with uh, what you use and how to get, have some quality control in terms of what you use in terms of online research because the internet is vast. Um, there are lots of different ways of accessing it and I think particularly when you're writing something substantial like a dissertation or a thesis, you want to have some quality control um, and make sure that the references that you're using are substantial, substantiated, academically valid and things like that. So um, it is tough because obviously without access to particularly older books and also publications, periodicals, and you can't get to, let's say, your college library and look at back issues of AD or something, that is a huge loss. But um, there are lots of those things that you can access. If you're at a formal educational institution, then probably your online library has lots of resources. Um, and they're often, you know, they're often not very easy to navigate in your university's backend system, but you need to sort of really get used to using database searches because you're, again, if you're lucky enough to be at an institution, your institutional subscriptions are going to let you access a lot more than Google search will let you access. So, um, I mean, I don't want to be sort of necessarily spending time telling you about basic Google searches and how you can make them better, but I guess I would just really encourage you to um, use sort of formal academic databases and memberships and, um, you know, I probably shouldn't advise people using institutional subscriptions that happen to belong to friends and so on, but, you know, things happen. You can find your way onto valid academic sources. Um, if you can't do that, then there are still a lot of papers and um, platforms out there that share um, things like eFlux architecture, things like the Avery review. There are lots of, um, let's say, non-subscription academically valid um, periodicals out there online and have a look at their writers, have a look at their um, reference list, have a look at bibliographies on things that you can find. So to take comfort in, let's say, keeping the quality of your reading up and making sure you can kind of trace the sources of where it goes back. If you're on Dazine, for instance, and if there's a guest columnist, look at who they are, look at what else they do, look at what else they're sort of, so that you're not just quoting an article on Dazine, but you're quoting a person who's a museum director, perhaps somewhere, and you sort of know the provenance of what you're looking for. So I think with online research, don't get slack about the quality, I think would be my um, strong advice to anyone writing a dissertation or thesis. I'm gonna stop talking for now and let Tom say some stuff. Tom, do you wanna to add to that? Um, I mean, that all seems massively sensible. I, I, surely, given the, the time that everyone's been away from uni in the UK, Europe and US, someone has put together a how you research online pretty comprehensive blog <laughs> or, or post. If not, someone should do it because they will like it. it yeah, I, I, I imagine that... We should do it. <laughs> you, you should do it. <laughs> I imagine if you don't... Yeah, there, there will be... You'll be able to find a resource that helps you to find the resource if you can't find it. <laughs> That makes sense. But yeah. yeah, Googling how do I research online probably get you pretty far right now. But yeah, um the yeah, the the I found that you at both the unis I was at the navigating the online resources was a nightmare. But once you figured it out, it was all right. It just you just have to spend 
day or two of just being really pissed off with a system that doesn't seem to work in any logical way. Um, but then once you get through that, it, it's it's fine, you know, like everything. Then you're like, oh, okay, maybe this is this is done for a reason, and you, know, you figure it out. Um, again, my dissertation, I did a lot of first person research, so I, it, it, I couldn't do it now because I had to walk around London loads. But um, <laughs> yeah, there are ways, though. I mean, academics everywhere are probably not going to forgive me, but we are all sat at home, most of us. So if you've been reading a few articles by for instance and you want to ask him some questions about the data centers i dare say if you tweeted at him or, or sent him a message somewhere he might I've try been, and get back to you edited in a few dissertations on data centers following my <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know everyone, some everyone's you know, very, i know if, you know aren't they like i like she says everyone everyone right now understands that there's kind of a bit of a everyone's in it together spirit mm -hmm. it feels like um so yeah, like reaching out. To and most of us really like teaching. So like, just ask questions. So if you can't, you know, if you can't get to your tutor, I think let's just acknowledge that it is an extraordinary situation. But um, people are at home. You can do primary research in in different ways. Again, that's not the same as walking around a site and doing, you know, taking photographs or what have you. But there are ways to be kind of inventive. Um, Perhaps your research doesn't allow that, and then raise your hand, and we can talk about what your circumstance is. But um, there are kind of ways to use this time when people are sitting at home. Um, and also, if you need, if I mean, on a basic level, if you need articles that sorry, caps tax me. If you need um, articles that are written by people, they undoubtedly have copies of them. You know, <laughs> like so. I mean. If you can't find a particular a particular source a particular piece of whatever it is email the person you know and say yeah. I, know, I know this is awkward but it's a real weird situation i can't get to my library can you send me your pdf like or a photograph of you know this page in a book i have so many books i wish i could you know lend them out to you but i can't but you know we can talk about them though still and that's the thing that's given a really great tip that um researchgate and academia.edu um allow you to message an author. So uh, you can request the text that's not accessible on the site, uh, which is a great tip, thanks. Um, so also I thought maybe now is probably about time to kind of open this up to other, other people. So if anyone has a kind of question or a thought or if any of the other kind of tutors who are around on, on board here want to have a quick chat, um, raise your hand or pop something in the chat here. We've got a few. Um, is this one? Yeah. Uh, so Jan Marco says, uh, I'm starting now the research stage of an essay that has to feature the use of two case studies to discuss a contemporary issue in architecture. I'm focusing on alternative ways of living in the densifying contemporary cities, in parallel touching on how a contemporary cultural shift into a more liquid society, Bauman, reflects on the changing concept of dwelling, do you have any suggestions for resources or case studies? Can you share your ideas on this topic? That's quite a question. <laughs> uh, gosh, uh, density is such a topical issue at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, in the non-architectural press, there's quite a lot about this. And I think uh, given that you are writing this paper in this moment, um, would seem appropriate to sort of think about it from the position of this moment. I saw a good article in the New York Times, I think, about the future of cities and why density will continue to be important, even though um, the current situation almost doesn't allow us to think about density or proximity in any way. Um, yeah, look, I think you said you're focusing on alternative ways in uh, of living in densifying contemporary cities. I think the way to navigate this question is to think about why you're asking that question. What are the possible sort of concerns or, or pressures towards that? And that might help you to choose your case studies. Don't you think? Yeah. Um, 
so too. I think it's like, and it's doing, I think if you start to do some of that research and start to kind of read around the stuff on cities um, and read some kind of books or texts on that, then you'll start to have an idea of some case studies which come up while you're reading maybe essays on density or city planning or things like that. Tom, do you want to add anything? No. <laughs> I, I was just thinking sort yeah. of you need to ask yourself what's at stake with, uh, kind of any essay question in in terms of trying to figure out what case studies to pick or what kind of approach to take I think oftentimes students will pick on a subject like a topic a phenomenon this happens I want to write about this because it happens and and then get a little bit stuck because lots of this happens in lots of different ways so how do I pick which one to talk about and it's just that extra level of kind of poking well so what that this happens what's at stake like why does it matter um, and that might help you to choose kind of extremes of whatever example like what happens at the extreme of density what happens in situations when there is what's at stake in terms of isolation do you want to look at this psychologically do you want to look at this in terms of community identity and that will help you to pick up, uh, you know, which case studies you want to exhibit because um, otherwise it's, it's just stopping at the topic phase doesn't help you to choose what kind of discussion you want to have. So I think in your question, let's see, uh, Marco, a little bit further in so what uh, about density and different types of dwelling. Yeah, it's like deep, dig that little bit deeper almost, isn't it? Is there a political agenda, is there a social agenda, is there an environmental agenda, like do you want to ex examine all of these possible agendas? Okay. Definitely feels very broad. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's normal though, at this stage of writing an essay, it, that's why you do research, that's why you kind of look at all the different examples and you think, okay, I'm particularly interested in this one, and that means not that one, and then... That's it. Yeah, but that's, that's what I mean, I meant normal now, but need to read and look and find out which bit of that is interesting to you basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay thank you perfect um, oh there you are we've had another <laughs> yeah <laughs> from Maya. i don't know if that's how you say your name i'm sorry i'll apologize now um who says how can architecture students contribute to the pandemic um, Tom, you've done a lot of writing about like what's, what others are doing to contribute to the pandemic. So um, what would you say architecture students could do? I mean, step one, just be personally useful, right? As in just generally uh, follow recommendations and be a useful citizen of the world. <laughs> I mean, it's probably needs saying that everyone feels like it. My dad definitely does. That it doesn't quite apply to him. Um, so generally be useful. Um, <laughs> But we've been mostly covering like the bits that hit in the news of people being actively proactively making stuff and doing stuff um i don't know whether that applies to design students i'm sure it does i mean a lot of mask making by individual people seems to be helping right now but does it um them tokenistic though or like is there much point in it so some of it i i've been treating it the benefit of the doubts um there's been a lot of people who are just a fair number of commenters who generally dislike everything we publish um and they're pointing out things like when carla ratti's designing a container medical center that it's not actually useful but um i don't know i'm willing to give a relatively well-known Italian architect living in the midst of a disaster who's worked with a serious medical organization quite benefit of the doubt so I think some of it is tokenistic maybe I think some of it is useful um, design students I don't know I suppose it's now's a good time to look at the world and the problems of the world which this is very much bringing to, to the forefront this is kind of high really highlighting a lot of issues with globalization with communications with manufacturing construction every, architecture with everything this is kind of focusing the mind for a lot of people so whatever you're doing try and focus yourself to think about how it can help um i mean there are ish things that 
designing students can add enter and be if they want to and have time like the global uh was it the dubai global degree show where they're literally anyone they're asking for people's ideas that could help a future coronavirus impacted world um and the global grad show okay. they call it. yeah and but i mean anyone they that they are so that's that sort of kind of use your brain to help and to just think about solutions or problems or how the world will be impacted i mean that show gives they give they're paying for people's anyone they they feature they're paying for a year's uh the uh, what I mean, a year's worth of um university fees basically or equivalent so I think up to something like 15 grand so for each person they feature so I mean like there are things where that, that students right now across the world design students will be creating the solutions that can be implemented in the future I would hope <laughs> you're a massively positive view on it yeah I mean uh this uh, I don't know like Tom says there are mixed feelings about whether or not these opportunities opportunities are somewhat parasitic or in good taste or too soon or, or whether they're sort of validated enough to be actually usable in terms of people homemaking masks, for example. Um, and oftentimes, but you have to think about, come on, why are we doing this? Is it an order? Is it a sort of psychological exercise for us to feel like we're contributing or, or, or sort of thinking in a united way rather than it actually being useful in terms of actual usefulness to the global situation sadly um you know staying safe staying at home and looking after each other probably is the most sensible thing that we can do um i was involved in some conversations with some academics at american universities often with much larger um facilities in terms of 3d printing and so on and that there was some discussion in terms of why haven't our labs been requisitioned to produce things um to 3d th print things on mass and so on there, there are two programs there's there's one in the us i think there's one in the UK, here right where you can sign up and they will you basically yeah people are it, it's slow but people are coordinating that now yeah so I think on an institutional level, and obviously this varies according to what the government's like where you are, but on an institutional level, you know, you might be, it might be worth asking questions if you happen to work for or go to a university that has massive facilities to 3D print loads of masks or something, then by all means, write a letter to somebody and say, is anyone thinking about this? But beyond that, I don't know how much uh, usefulness uh, we can actually contribute to the to the sort of global medical effort or kind of but I think you guys are both right in terms of you can use the opportunity to position yourself as a practitioner and think about I mean you know a couple of weeks ago when we were watching Italian people sing from balconies I mean I'm <laughs> if I if I have an area of particular interest I guess housing design and particularly social housing design is of interest to me so I was looking at how we live along terraced streets largely in in the UK I, I live on a Georgian terrace street and I was thinking well that just wouldn't work because our architecture doesn't afford a kind of communal visibility or conversation so it just wouldn't work so it's interesting how different forms different shapes of architecture um, you know facilitate or don't certain kinds of communication or action i mean other people are thinking about rent crises and and um landlords to you know how how that affects actual housing rather than house design there's lots of ways to sort of position yourself in terms of your own interests at the moment and yeah use the time to engage in conversations and so on but in terms of usefulness it's a tough one i don't i don't know how much we're able to contribute to efforts maybe it's not the usefulness now and like that global grad show it that, that's that's looking at kind of post coronavirus uh design problems so kind of things that's about right. the things about how systems work within the, the so not looking i mean trying to someone now 
a design student trying to design something like a ventilator example it's obviously relatively silly waste of time but like um but trying to think about future systems at some point assume design students will be you know in positions where they can make change or now can make change so yeah i'd say look at maybe not the immediate not look at it as something you can immediately do but more there is a future world post uh pandemic which needs to be shaped yeah i think that's a really good point i think there's like a lot of different things that you you can um kind of research and there's i think someone's been putting a few comments in here about looking at kind of smart villages and how communities adapt um and different kind of residential projects and spaces between housing and things so i think that's like it all kind of ties into how we think about kind of the future of society after after a pandemic and the research that kind of students can do into that. Um, does anyone else have any any questions or anything that they kind of want to? Ah, here we go. A question for Shumi uh, from Michael. So, um, as a curator of architecture exhibitions, do you have any thoughts about the future of exhibition platforms in times when gatherings might not be viable? Um, the future of exhibition platforms. Yeah, I guess a redefinition of what an exhibition platform is might um, be called for. Uh, you know, <laughs> making these kind of cliched comments about um, architecture being the backdrop of our lives. Well, not so much when you can't go outside <laughs> or go anywhere. Um, you know, uh, you guys know that I've been working with Space Popular quite a lot over the last 18 months. So the sorts of realms of possibility of virtual spaces or augmented spaces or purely online spaces where socialization might occur. Um, I, I think that might be something to consider. Um, all the exhibitions and institutions that I'm involved with or in touch with or those people whom I know who work at other museums, everybody's thinking about, well, how do we deliver exhibitions online now? Do we sort of, uh, and what also that's kind of exclusive if you're, if, you're, um, if you're only going to be able to distribute things using, let's say a VR setup, then you're excluding everybody who doesn't have a VR headset. So how to sort of cater for people when they're in different time zones and with different kinds of accessibilities. Um, it's not uninteresting, it's really exciting. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge pity not to be able to produce a spatial experience as a curator and to, to not to be able to deal with real objects, artifacts and uh, design that goes up into making an exhibition environment. But if exhibition making is about storytelling in a way, um, then it's just like slightly retooling how we do that, you know, perhaps even delving into things like filmmaking and, uh, and so on. It involves working with a different set of design professionals, but you can still tell stories. Um, in terms of togetherness and gatherings, yeah, uh, what, a, what a shame, uh, Venice, Milan, <laughs> all kinds of things aren't happening. Um, and I think we all in our various fields are going to have to figure out the scales of togetherness. You know, I think over the last five, 10 years, we've gotten used to Skype conversations. I think this year very much we're going to be used to this size of conversation, but not the sort of mega gatherings like you have at a Venice or a Chicago or something where you have sort of cross pollination across all sorts of um, strata and scale of design professionals. I don't know how those large scale conversations are going to pan out online. We'll just have to see. Yeah, it's a battle I've been kind of had myself in my own head because obviously I run an organization where the whole premise is based on experience and experiencing a set of houses and we can't do that physically anymore. So uh, yeah, we've been kind of thinking of ways that we can experience the houses without actually having being here so trying to do tours over Instagram and um, today I've been like taking the same photo every hour to see if I can prove like that the light changes and then the sun went in nothing was changed I was like well that was pointless <laughs> so it's kind of like weird things that you learn as you're doing kind of different ways of programming but 
it's it's a weird world of nobody quite knows what the answer is yet I mean at some point I don't know um, how these things get passed up food chains but at some point you should get Google Arts and Culture to send a camera and do a sort of internal 3D scan or something I'm sure that would be popular and it's the kind of feature that we're starting to see anyway again at the at the RIBA though there are there is a latent conversation between um you know various kinds of virtual platforms that can offer the RIBA ways to expand its collection and access to it and all of that stuff I suppose just wants to be slightly accelerated now um so I mean, I was just talking to the librarian who works with the architecture department at Central St. Martins, and she was saying there's loads of places that your students can go and visit on Google Arts and Culture that have been VR scanned. And um, it might be interesting to have a discussion about the difference between experiencing a space in real time and, and space and experiencing a place in virtual platforms um, and kind of opening a conversation up to what does it mean to visit somewhere virtually and what's the difference between that and a material experience. And I think these kinds of conversations are quite uniquely placed right now. Yeah. Sorry, I was just thinking about uh, Walmy Yard and what a special space it is to be in and how it would be amazing to have a 3 d VR tour of it, but it would be very different to being there in real life. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I've just noticed, Lee, you put you put a little question. Do you want to just say it to us? Mm -hmm. Can I shall I unmute you? Um, you might need to unmute yourself. I can't unmute Put myself. Yeah, I've unmuted. I was just commenting on that um, question of usefulness, really, um, and kind of saying that it's always worth bearing in mind what we actually have agency over. You know, and currently the most impact and the most use might be your immediacy. Maybe you don't need to worry about solving a global pandemic. You just need to worry about the person next door to you or the person across the table from you or, you know, who it is that you can, you know, make a cup of tea for or, or that kind of thing. And when you take that to a design situation, then a lot of us have now had to rapidly adapt our living circumstances to accommodate a new use so that's immediately setting up a design challenge which we've either all kind of muddled through or we've solved in a meaningful way but even that's a starting point for a brief in terms of how you want to think about the way we live in the immediate and the longer term you know that kind of ability to rapidly change a circumstance to 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 adapt seems quite critical now i spent hardly any time at home before now because I live in Scotland and work in Preston and I had I have a house here that I spent two days a week in and now I'm in it all the time and that's amazing but also now the way I think about that is, is changed totally um, so that's a good starting point to think about as well I also think thinking about you know we're being told to stay two meters away from each other we're being told to exercise within about one and a half kilometers of where we live. So those distances kind of open up interesting design questions as well. You know, it's like if actually the most of the world that we get to see physically is within a one and a half kilometer radius, then, you know, what is the perfect, most amazing one and a half kilometer radius that you could ever think of to exist in? Because if that's all you're going to get to see physically, you might set that as a design challenge. And also that kind of two meter distancing I think is interesting as for architects to consider as well. If we can, if we can only have, if we only have the two meters between us, how does that become interesting or fun or engaging or still active? What can we throw at each other from two meters without infecting each other? You know, how can we feel some sense of belonging to each other at that distance? So, those were kind of some of the the things that I was thinking about in relation to to that particular topic. That's great. I kind of I like the idea of like that we now suddenly kind of understand what two meters is. Um, like I was I was playing this game with uh, my nephew where we were trying to uh, guess things that were two meters, and he never he had no idea what two meters was. And <laughs> <laughs> so it was always yes. 
weird guessing game of like how big things are. And I think I often find that with my first year students is they, they can't really visualize how big space is. And so now I think we've all got a kind of clearer idea of space. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's also, it's much harder to skip a queue when <laughs> you have to stay two meters. It's much easier to spot someone trying to rush to the front when everyone's spread out by two meters. Mm -hmm. so it's definitely, it's changed the nature of queuing for the better. We just have a kind of like dispersed rabble outside the co-op at the end of our street and everyone's a little bit, you know, too scared to look at each other. But at least uh, at least we're not kind of arguing and shuffling and stuff. So, so all of that's quite, this, this kind of, the whole social dynamic of that is, is really quite fascinating, I think, the distancing. Definitely. It's fair to say there'll be a lot of research done on the kind of urban impact of, or the urban involvement of the built environment from the pandemic I mean probably everyone everyone not in their final year of any sort of architecture thing will be looking at it now <laughs> right It'll be the next like I guess. urban farming <laughs> next year yeah. everyone's everyone's this station will be on it like literally I'm, some different angle I'm right? very much thinking about uh I grew up in Calcutta and the idea of social distancing where you're two meters away from people in a city of 16 million people is not possible um so I'm, I'm thinking about that but also because we really can't see ahead um i'm also just raising a little flag for those of us in architecture and design who perhaps um who perhaps won't go into addressing entirely pragmatic questions that are related to kind of crisis response know that there are there are kind of architectural projects and um, intellectual pursuits that exist outside of it and that will continue and that must continue and, and continue to be nurtured. I mean, I just don't want anyone to feel like um, if they're not doing something practical towards the cause that they're wasting their time. Um, and I guess also just to think about um, the many, many instances in history where every single way that we live and custom that we occupy and they, they all respond to something you know the way that um japanese architecture responds to a kind of impermanence which is yeah kind of written into a spiritual creed but also comes from the fact that seismically that place is not very stable and so um a kind of metabolic or a kind of dynamic architecture seems to make sense um a situation wherein let's say northern europe you don't have a high population density and so um the way that people live quite far apart from each other will start to stay in systems on the land and, and depending on the land makes sense you can't do that in a place where there's lots of density i just as a historian i think i'm really fascinated to see um that nothing comes from nowhere that these adaptations that we're making now are similar adaptations that people have always made to their living conditions and sort of trying to see patterns and yeah, obviously kind of learning from past experiences is, is something that we can spend a bit of time now, especially those of us who've had jobs cancelled. I think that those of us who work part time, um, there are opportunities to kind of have productive, reflective practices as well as productive design practices. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've just had we've had one. I think we'll probably take one or two last questions now. Um, so we've had one from Rodrigo, who I remember from last week. Uh, so he says um, he's currently finishing his doctoral dissertation on criticality and social agency of architecture in the 21st century. Um, however, now he's approaching the end, he's uncertain regarding the defense and how that would work. Um, but besides that, he's mostly worried about how to start working in the architectural theory world when the scenario is most likely to shrink in the near future. I would like to hear your opinions on how to work as a recent PhD graduate during and after pandemic scenarios. Um, Shumi, do you have thoughts on that? You're probably better. Basically. I'm just trying to find the question here. Yeah. Uh, Above Lee's question. I've managed to shrink my chat somehow. Sorry, you guys. Okay, 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 okay. I have it. Um, okay. Trying to finish my criticality, social agency architecture gosh that's a big subject well done Rodrigo <laughs> now I'm reaching the end of it um what do you mean you're uncertain regarding the defense 
You mean like a viva, how it's going to actually happen? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, mostly worry about is how it's actually happening. And you haven't been told by your supervisors how it's going to be happening? No, they're totally unclear. Okay, well, I guess, I mean, I'm just speaking kind of frankly and off the record and not on behalf of any particular institution, yep. all those disclaimers, all those quick disclaimers. Um, but I imagine that they're thinking very carefully about uh, what's the best opportunity for you guys, because the last thing that they're going to want is a load of legal issues down the line saying, I don't think my, um, you know, my viva was enough or, or kind of good enough or whatever so if they haven't communicated anything to you chances are they're really working out the best way to do it i would imagine though that it would happen over a perhaps not perhaps one or, or a couple of sessions like this i mean how else is it going to happen either that or maybe they allow you to pre-record something and and submit something like that if if this kind of situation is deemed to be too stressful but I imagine it would be um, a format like that. And if you have any, but they're going to ask you and they're going to ask you if you have any problems with that and if you anticipate any issues with that. I mean, I would imagine that they're going to be quite careful about providing you a, a trajectory that suits you. Um, what do you, what do you, what would you like in an ideal situation? Well, uh, I have no, no idea actually. Like I, I haven't, start to think about it like I, i'm pretty used to do video calls and and things like that but i mostly worry about uh, the um, uh the the protocols of the university because they always say it has to to be a public um defense i mm. don't know uh, what they consider public in that sense yes Yes, okay. So that's probably the conversation that they're having right now mm -hmm. is how do we compose a kind of jury or a sort of audience or review uh, panel that can be invited to listen to this and still maintain the, the kind of status of a unbiased, um, uh, what did you say, public, um, in order to listen to your defense. So they're probably just constructing that system now. So I'd advise like, by all means, ask questions and make a note of anything that you might be concerned about, but I'm sure they're gonna be trying their best to make it kind of fair and possibly recording, making that public. But again, they're gonna to have to ask for your permission for all of this stuff and um, insist on it if you're concerned about it. Um, Maybe you can ask them how you want it to be. Yeah. Yeah, that'd, that'd be a good start. Yeah. I mean, we're we're currently having to have conversations. I mean, I don't teach PhD students at the moment, but um, have conversations with our graduate and postgraduate students in terms of how much deadline delay is appropriate, um, and how on earth are people going to make models, and uh, mm -hmm. therefore how is the marking going to differ and these conversations are totally live at the moment and it's in everybody's interest to make students happy despite how impossible that seems to be at the moment um so yeah these conversations are just super live at the moment if they're not telling you stuff it's because they don't want to go back on it and i think Which, um, having like completely different approaches as well so like glasgow completely yeah. all marking and hand-ins and everything and then other schools are kind of still working out that approach. So maybe like as a PhD student, if you were to kind of go to your school with a kind of, this is how I think it should be. And you had that proactive kind of thought, then that might get taken into account. Yeah, I mean, that's going back to the question of usefulness from, from students. I think the other thing that you can do is, is talk between yourselves about things that you want in the future and, and what would be useful and, and make yourselves heard a little bit because everybody's looking for better ideas to move forward. And so, yeah, within your PhD community, I notice Andre has just posted a note saying he went to a public viva on YouTube and it seems to go very smoothly because of the sort of understanding that's going on at the moment. To come to your second question, which I don't know why I'm doing because it's a lot harder to answer. <laughs> your how do you make money, um, essentially, no? Uh, after having studied architectural theory, tough call, Pete. 
no. Um, don't mm. teach in the UK. <laughs> oh, I would like to. <laughs> Uh, um, but, yeah. but that's the problem I, I, I find myself in. It's like um, I was supposed to start in a kind of war that was in a way booming. And now is to put it all into question, obviously, as everything else. But then like uh, it's almost like what do I do after five years of PhD? But don't throw it away. I think this course will recover and often flourishes in such situations. So I think, I mean, the field you're in isn't the problem. The problem is the system that pays for it. And that's going to take longer, a shakier kind of road to recover. So, yeah, I don't, I think this maybe goes to some of us. I don't know if doing the things that we love will necessarily pay the rent as directly for a little while we might have to find ourselves doing other things that we're good at and thinking about our skills perhaps slightly more laterally um but i don't know you know i'm i am pulling this out of my ass as much as anybody else is like i, I don't really know I, I can see that universities are very very uncertain at the moment so i understand that teaching contracts are not going to be plentiful this september it's very difficult to know how universities are gonna um yeah manage to kind of fulfill the number of contracts that they normally do so it's it's very uncertain especially in terms of academics who produce immaterial value right mm -hmm. so i think it, it might be a case of um intensifying the discourse we have amongst ourselves you know like this and thinking about ways to kind of keep that alive. Um, but I'm not sure where our rents and money is going to be coming from. I mean, one thing for sure is that after this period, there needs to be a reevaluation of who's worth what. That's a larger question, no? like a kind of more structural question. But um, I don't know, a lot of professionals, a lot of professionals in my field are thinking about how to decouple how they make their money and this sort of activity, sad to say. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it's just like you everyone's gonna have a change in tack of like what necessarily what they're doing. Um but it's also like that doesn't mean that it's bad or like that it's worrying or like I think we can use, you know, this to kind of reevaluate things and um some of the best things came out of like the recession, some of the most interesting practices, some of the most interesting work. Um, so it doesn't mean that like there won't be anything, you know. And it doesn't mean your PhD is going to be useless. Like actually, like you're probably coming out at a good time, you know. Just like not a good time, but, yeah. <laughs> like there's opportunity, you know. Well, like the classic example that I've been talking about with students, and it's a problematic example, and that's why it's a fun one, is like the classic example, I guess, in London, if you're an architecture student in London, is Archigram, everyone shoved Archigram in your face, like, oh, they did such amazing things when they were really young, and, you know, they did it in their downtime, just like you guys, you know, they all got together in Peter Cook's flat, or whoever's flat it was in Hampstead, and, you know, Xeroxed things, and cut and paste, and made these zines, and they've endured in their architectural significance for the next 50 years and yeah that that is hugely inspiring what you can do in your sort of you know they nobody in archigram was making money from archigram archigram never built anything never really made any money at all um but they were only able to do that because the society that they were living in had found a place for them in which they had a dependable wage you know, they were all architects for the lcc so they could pay rent um so they had a kind of base level of comfort, which allowed them to produce all this intellectual value on the side. So that opportunity is nice to look forward to, but it might be that we have to produce our intellectual value but on the side of what? And those are kind of bigger questions that we need to ask um, the society that we live in. Like, how can we be useful, but bigger? Yeah, definitely. I think um, that's it, probably a good, point to start to wind up on just because I know um, our speakers have got other places to be and, um, and it's uh, 10 past 5 uh, so I'd just like to say a huge huge thanks to I've just I, 
I can I can be back at work in literally like <laughs> like <months>. straight away. <laughs> that other place to be is like you're <laughs> in the same spot. You know? Yeah, yeah. I may, I may go back into the garden, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just like I to say that. that Thanks. I just say thank you so much for both of you. I'm sorry, Thomas. I just talked all over you. I always do this in crit. Yeah. But um, it's it's it's. Uh, I don't have to go back to work, so I'm I'm either happy to stay online for a bit or happy to kind of continue with you on social media, or what have you. Cool. Well, I, yeah, I'd just like to say a massive thanks to everyone for coming and to Shumi and Tom for kind of giving up an hour of their afternoon. Um, to do this. Um, I think it's really useful to have these conversations. Uh, it is for me anyway, it's like someone else to chat to that's not my cat. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and I, so we're going to do another one next week um, and that one's going to have more of a focus on different ways of practicing um, and kind of different things you can do if you're kind of graduating or supposed to be graduating this summer and aren't quite sure what's going to be happening. Um, we've got a few people who are going to join that have kind of set up different types of practices. Um, and then I think the, the, the next week we'll do a more uh, general one. Um, so yeah, if you kind of came along for this and, it, and you kind of thought it was useful and keep an eye out, I'll post the kind of link for the next one on Twitter and Instagram and things like that. I'll be back, that sounds great. Great. <laughs> well, um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, and bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. You guys, if you heard about this through Laura's link, then you know where to find me on social media. If you've got any other questions or you want another Zoom chat at some point, let me know. Happy Thanks. to talk. Thanks. Cool. Bye. 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 Nice to see you all. Bye. <laughs> Bye.